Carl, thank you so much. Really beautiful. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome uh, on this fine Sunday morning to the First Unitarian Church here in Salt Lake City and to our eighth and last in our Summer Forum Speaker Series. Our topic this morning is homelessness in Utah. Our speaker is Pamela Atkinson. Before I introduce her in detail, I want to just uh, remind you of our format. Uh, our speaker will uh, present for about 20 minutes, half an hour approximately. When she concludes, then we'll take a couple minutes to again uh, hear from Carl while we pass the plate, the offering. And then uh, um, after the offering, we'll go to questions and answers. And uh, we'll have two microphones, uh, wireless, Kathy on one side, myself on the other. Uh, look for us, signal to us, a nod, a hand, and in sequence, speaking to the mic because we're on video and audio, uh, we'll uh, get to all of you and we'll have questions until approximately about 11.15 and then uh, conclude with a couple of remarks and then uh, next door for more conversation and coffee. So uh, with that in mind, I want to uh, uh, introduce, well, what can I say about Pamela Atkinson? She grew up in London, very poor, very poor. Her father was a gambler. He left the home, left his wife, left two sons, left three daughters. She slept in one bed with two daughters, two, two sisters, and then she was the only one of her siblings to be able to graduate from high school. And she was accepted into a very um, uh, competitive nursing program. She then moved to America where uh, she married uh, and uh, had uh, 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 three children. Now she's the grandmother of 10 grandkids, or 10 grandkids. Um, she earned a uh, nursing degree and a master's in sociology. She's worked in hospital administration for LDS Hospital and Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, she has served on so many boards and commissions, been honored for her humanitarian work because this issue of homelessness never goes away. It's always with us. So, you know, here we're very fortunate to have Pamela Atkinson speak to us today. She's an angel, I think, in our midst. Let's welcome our speaker today. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that <clears throat> introduction. And Carl, thank you so much. Um, you know, my, some of my colleagues and I have a term for when we've given and given and given, we reach what we call emotional bankruptcy. And um, I have several remedies for that. And uh, one is getting together with friends, with meals, and having a good time and recharging the batteries. But the other is classical music, and it's music to my soul. And that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Well, I'm setting my timer. I um, uh, appreciate um, Tim. Uh, he's very punctual, isn't he? And, and, and I, just, I, I, really, I really enjoy that. <clears throat> so I thought I'd set my timer, which is why I have my phone up here. And uh, um, I, like many of you, I really enjoy my phone. Um, but I did have some battles with Siri. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming some of you did too. Siri would say, I don't understand what you're saying. And I thought, well, for goodness sake, I enunciate clearly. And so I battled on and, and kept on trying. And I got so frustrated after 10 times of her not understanding me. So I got into the settings and to my joy, I found out you can change Siri to a British Siri. So I now have this British male who is so polite and understands every word that I say. And so if any of you want to try it just for a change of pace, uh, please do. You know, periodically, um, I like to reflect on uh, where I am in life and how I got here and where I came from. And as um, Tim said, uh, it was uh, certainly an interesting childhood. Uh, I remember being um, in, a, in a large house at one point. 
my father did own greyhound dogs and made, made a lot of money. But I also know that he lost all the money and lost the, the, the dogs. And also, eventually he took off. And as Tim said, he left my mother with, uh, without any means of support uh, for the five kids. Uh, it, it, it was interesting. And this whole business of children being separated from their parents in, with this administration, um, with our friends coming from elsewhere, uh, caused me to have quite a few flashbacks. I, I do remember um, part of the war, and um, <clears throat> I was one of the children who was sent away from uh, parents uh, as an evacuee. And uh, I remember uh, uh, getting on this train with all these other children and feeling lost and bewildered. And we were taken down to Devon and there were a number of uh, chaperones, and they got us off the train and onto a bus, and then we were taken to this street, and we were lined up on the corner of the street, <clears throat> and the people who said they would take evacuees came along looking at us and saying, oh, I don't think I want that one. I think maybe that one. And I felt like I was in the zoo. And so when all of this business came up of the children being separated uh, from their parents as they crossed the border, I had vivid uh, recollections of, of what that meant and wh how traumatic it is to have that separation. And then to go back home several years later and, and feel like a stranger. And um, it, it's something that never ever leads you. It's why my heart is torn for, for these kids who are still separated and not able to be with their parents and the damage that continues uh, to be done. I'm, I'm, I'm actually in awe of, of how much that has happened in my life that has led me to, to where I am today. Um, it was hard uh, to grow up in poverty. It was very hard not to have a bathroom in the house. It was a a toilet just outside the back door we could use. But basically, it was the slums in the southeast of uh, London. It was hard when you didn't have the clothes to wear uh, until I was um, 11 and passed a special exam and got to go to a school where they had uniforms. But even so, you could tell the frayed collar, the frayed cuffs, the shiny skirt. And um, not being able to be clean all the time, I often wondered why I was always picked last to be on a team. <laughs> and it was much later in life I thought, hmm, couldn't take a bath, couldn't take a shower except once a week at another place. There may be have been an odor, and that's why I wasn't picked. Um, so when I see teams being picked of kids, my heart goes out to those who are left and, and, until, and, until the, the last one. One of the things I did learn, uh, it was about age 14, <clears throat> I thought, I've got to learn a great deal. I've got to finish school. My older brother uh, left school at age 14. And I thought, if, if I continue learning and get an education, that may be the way out of being poor. And as we know, all know, education is one of the main ways out of poverty. And getting into University College Hospital, there were 400 applicants at that time, and I was one of 52. And I was the only lower class person. Everybody else was upper class or middle class. And I soon found out the difference, but I also found out some really wonderful people. And I loved nursing, and I loved giving uh, to people and taking care of people. When I, when I came to uh, the United States, oh, by the way, I did go to Australia for a few years, and I decided I wanted to be a sheep farmer. Um, <clears throat> but the, the farm people weren't interested in somebody with a nursing uh, diploma. So I worked in a hospital and worked with on the islands between New Guinea and Australia. And I worked with Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders and absolutely loved um, 
the islanders and aborigines who lived such a simple life and who were very happy. And I remember delivering their babies and um, they'd come walking in casually and say, I think my baby's coming. And I distinctly remember several times where I had to do a dive on the ground to catch the baby. That's how casual um, they were. But these are all experiences and uh, a part of what I call my informal education of life. Coming to America was, was a little bit of a shock. Uh, that I thought they spoke English, but apparently it was American English. And um, I, uh, I thought, I've got to learn to talk American. Well, I, I picked up the terminology, but um, when I try to say bath instead of bath, it just doesn't work. So I gave up on that. But what I found in America is the fact that people are accepted. People are not, well, when I came, people weren't judged on whether, what, which socioeconomic status to which they belonged. There was something about America and Americans that encouraged people like me, yes, you can do it. And I remember that one of the deans at the University of Pennsylvania getting me to take some exams and saying, you can do it. Because please remember, people living in poverty grow up with a very low self-esteem. And it stays with you much of the life, but it improves. But I was amazed that I could get an education. I could get accepted by people. One of the things I, I discovered is <clears throat> when, when I came to Utah with my youngest daughter at that point and the others were at college, was I learned how accepting and friendly uh, Utahns were, even more than what I'd seen um, in New York, Pennsylvania, California, Washington, or Oregon, where I'd lived. And I thought, I want to be able to do something. I understand, having gone through much of what people are going through, I understand what it's like to live in poverty. It's a very special day today. Um, one year ago, we tackled the Rio Grande problem with our homeless friends. <clears throat> it was on the 14th. But one year ago today, this Sunday, um, my Presbyterian church on South Temple, we take one Sunday a year and we have what is called faith in action. And we had five different projects, and I was with the project where we were making up sack lunches to take down to our homeless friends. So we drove down there, and I had um, my friends from First Presbyterian set up a table at, at the far end of Rio Grande with the sandwiches and the bottle of water and the desserts and what have you. And the Rio Grande at that point was just packed with people sitting, standing, lying around. And um, people were a little, my friends were a little nervous and I said, this is okay, you just stay here and I'll send people to you to get lunches. And, and I knew what was there because I'd been there, you know, several days in the past week. But what I saw were drug deals going on, walking down one side and down up the other and walking along 2nd South and along 5th West, there were dozens and dozens of drug deals. There were people injecting themselves. There were people passed out. There were people who were um, acting out. There were a lot of people I knew and they were saying, hi, Pamela. And uh, I stopped at one place and, and this guy said, oh, hi, Pamela. And the drug dealer who was giving him the drug said, oh yeah, hi Pamela, do you want some of my stuff? And well, I was used to drug dealers asking me and I just would say, uh, no thank you. But I, I said, you know, I've got something better. I've got food, good food for you. And they said, he said, oh, when I finish this deal, I'll go down. But, and so it went on. It was absolutely heart-wrenching to see where people <clears throat> had become so sick and so high on drugs. So many people had been evicted from their homes because they preferred to buy opioids rather than buying, um, rather than paying the rent. 
So we eventually gave out all of the food, and people were very uh, grateful for it. Uh, there were some of my homeless friends there saying, when are you going to do something about this, Pamela? And I was, although I was part of the decision-making group, there was nothing I could say. And I was just saying, we're working on it, we're working on it, other than that, and give some of my homeless friends a hug and, and a warm handshake. But the next morning, and this is history now, a year ago, uh, early in the morning, a helicopter came over Rio Grande Street and hovered over there, over the street. The drug dealers, the criminals who were all hiding in there, all of those people, they got up and ran, right into the arms of over a thousand law enforcement people who had surrounded the area. And that was the first phase of a three-phase program, was arresting people who were criminals. But you know what's heartbreaking? We had people coming up to law enforcement saying, I've got drug paraphernalia in my pocket. So can I give it to you? Could you arrest me so I could get treatment? And people literally were asking for that. And we, there were mentally ill people. There were people who had been high on drugs, so ill, their behavior was completely out of control. And then, gradually, as things quietened down and a lot of the criminals fled elsewhere, <clears throat> we um, started to do an assessment of the people who needed help so badly. And so people were being assessed for drug court. And um, up to uh, the end of June, 125 people in the past year have gone through drug court and are in housing and getting their lives back together. And that's a tremendous triumph. But we also had to look at the fact we needed more beds for inpatient treatment for many of our clients, either for drug addiction or, or mental illness. The third phase was um, housing and, and jobs. And um, a number of people have been able to get jobs, stop the drugs, get the jobs, and are in housing. But as many of you know, um, housing is, is, affordable housing is one of our worst problems. In the state of Utah, there is a need for 47,000 rental units. From north to south, 47,000 of affordable housing units. Some of um, our uh, homeless friends have become homeless because their rents have gone up so high. Nobody should be paying more than 30% of their income for rent. And we have people now who are paying 40, 50, even 60% of their income for rent. When you think about people <clears throat> who are living in poverty but do have a home, they're, they're, they have two main areas that they concentrate on. One is keeping a roof over their heads. And the second one is having food on the table. Did you know you can prevent homelessness by donating a bag of food to a food pantry, like Crossroads Urban or other food pantries, the food bank? One bag of food given to a family that they can use to eat for a few days means the parent or parents don't have to take rent money and buy food. <clears throat> it's a real challenge for families, uh, and particularly for our, our children, who have food insecurity, which means at some point they go to bed hungry. It's a real challenge for children to go to school on an empty stomach unless there's a breakfast program there. And many schools have the breakfast program and the lunch program. And many schools now have food pantries and they're giving kids backpacks full of food to take home so that the kids have something to eat over the weekend. I mean, we all realize 
kids cannot learn if they're on trying to learn on an empty stomach. And kids can't learn if they're sick. And up at the legislature, I, um, I work up there quite a bit. I, I actually work as an advisor to Governor Herbert, have an office up there, and I work with his um, uh, leadership team and his cabinet. <clears throat> and um, I, so I have input on a lot of the decisions that are made. And with, with health care, I, I, I pointed out to the governor and his staff and also to um, the legislators, you, know, you keep on concentrating on funding education, um, but children can't learn if they're not healthy. You need to balance it out and make sure that the health care system is, is funded sufficiently so that the kids can take advantage of when the education uh, is, is also funded. There are many services that have been given and put out there for our, our homeless friends. And one of the most important, and I love working with this one, is the fact that um, St. Vincent de Paul has an evening meal and also a lunch meal. And it's not only for our homeless friends. Many low-income families make use of that lunch meal uh, or that uh, dinner meal in order to supplement their, their income so that they, there are several nights a week they can come down and, and get a meal. And then again, uh, they don't have to use their, their, um, uh, their, their rent money for that. <clears throat> With the lack of affordable housing, and people are working on it. I'm, I'm Mayor uh, Jackie Biskupski, she's, she's been great at making affordable housing one, one of her uh, priorities. And the Salt Lake County Housing Authority also. And there are certain developers who are coming up with mixed housing so that a certain number of the units, uh, apartments, are for um, uh, low-income low people. But right now, if you go to any of the motels down on State Street or on um, uh, North Temple, they're full. They're full of homeless people. And that's all that these people can afford. Sometimes they're families, sometimes, um, <clears throat> sometimes they're individuals. But homeless people will do anything to stay out of the shelter and off the streets in many instances. And by the way, the last count of homeless people in Utah found out there were many more homeless people who were unsheltered rather than sheltered. You're, you're here, um, homeless people say they will not go to the road home shelter uh, because it's got bed bugs, which isn't quite true actually, but because of the drugs and what have you. And um, the road home are in the middle of doing a uh, pilot study, which is having some wonderful quantifiable outcomes. And they have a, um, a Springer Spaniel belongs to the highway patrol um, who comes in and is a drug sniffing dog. But, you know, normally the, the police and the highway patrol, the dogs they have are those uh, big German shepherds. But we felt very strongly that that was too terrifying for our homeless friends uh, who were having so many other problems. So they have this wonderful Springer Spaniel called Ike. And Ike is very polite, very friendly. But he knows his job, and when people are lining up to go into the shelter, he'll go and sniff, and then he'll just sit very politely and look at the person until his handler and security comes over. <laughs> so um, Ike's become a favorite of, of many of us. And then um, we, they're also doing more in-depth searches and, and wanding and, and what have you, and, and really trying to keep out people who are trying to sneak in uh, guns or, or knives or, or drugs. And at, at this point, uh, people are, are very pleased. And uh, uh, I think a second audit will show much improvement. I think we have a responsibility to create a, a safe environment for people uh, where they can come in and get the case management we need. 
And, and you need to know that 80% of people who, about 80% of people who become homeless, they're gone from the shelter within a month. And, and this, if the housing is available, and, and this can occur because of a program we have called rapid rehousing. And if people do not have a multiplicity of problems and just need a little bit of help there and a little bit of a help here, then we can get them out of the shelter into a, a living arrangement. When people first come to the shelter to be admitted, we have what we call a diversion program. And this is to have um, one of our expert case managers interview them and see if there's any possible alternative than actually coming into the shelter. Is there a friend or is there a family whilst they look for alternative arrangements? But just think, 80% of people are gone from the shelter within a month. Some of them need some follow-up, which is, which is done. But we're looking at at least 10 to 15% of people are chronically homeless. <clears throat> and I have some homeless friends. Um, Denny's been homeless off and on for 30 years. Darren, um, I've known him, I just saw him last week actually, for 24 years, and he's deteriorating mentally. Does it mean we care for him less? Absolutely not, we just know he needs something else. A lot of questions have been asked about the fact that the total number of beds in the resource centers, three of them, does not add up to the total number of people within the shelter, and people were saying, you know, what's going to happen? <clears throat> I started talking um, with the Lieutenant Governor and others back in February about this. There are people who, when they go through the coordinated entry process, that where every homeless person gets an assessment, it may, they may find, you know, they don't fit in with the resource center because of some mental illness or or, or other uh, dis disabilities. So we've started talking about, you know, to, what, what is it that we could offer people? And one of the phrases that sticks in my mind was two years ago at Christmas, a colleague and I were out delivering meals and it was snowing um, and damp. And I found this one man in the bus shelter and uh, all of his belongings were, were wet. So gave him, uh, other than the meal, some dry clothing and what have you, and chatted with him. And I said, okay, Bill, tell me, what do you really need? And he said, Pamela, all I need is one room. I don't want a fancy apartment. I just want one room. So ever since then, I'd been thinking about <clears throat> these single room occupancy buildings, which, which has a room for, for everybody, and then shared showers and toilets, and uh, uh, you can put whatever you like in it. And did some research, and you know, found out, of course, that we tore down buildings like the Stratford and the Regency 15, 20 years ago. They were both uh, SROs. Did some research in terms of best practices across the country, and sure enough, SROs are they're, they're coming back. They have, they're having a revival. Um, so a group of us have been meeting and planning, and then um, uh, the next steps were focus groups with our homeless friends, just to see what they would like to see in such a building. And um, we bribed them with food as an incentive to come to a focus group. But <clears throat> I'm, I'm always delighted at how intelligent many of our homeless friends are, how articulate they are, and they were giving their opinions and respecting other speakers and other people's opinions. One focus group, though, there was a fight, but uh, that, that's what happens. And so um, um, my colleagues and I were able to stop the fight, eject two people, and then continue on. So as we're looking at you know, what the decision makers are saying, what the providers are saying, what our homeless friends are saying, we're beginning to form a, a, a picture of what alternative housing is needed in, in the state of Utah. And uh, we've got until June 2019 when the shelter closes. 
Um, my bottom line is no homeless person will be left behind. Every homeless person needs to go through the coordinated entry. But uh, the process is very thorough and a lot of people are gonna be helped by that. And these resource centers are going to be great. But I, I do have to say that um, if people don't fit into that resource center, we need by June of 2019 to have something in place. If we go to the SROs, it's about a third of the cost of uh, building an apartment building. But right now, coming online, we have um, one, uh, one small SRO planned. We also have, for chronic homelessness, another permanent supportive housing. There's a big one uh, down on Main Street called Palmer Court. There's Grace Mary Manor, there's Sunrise Metro, Kelly Benson. Permanent supportive housing are for people who fit the federal definition of chronically ill, and they're, they're uh, one bedroom apartments except for Palmer Court that has families with two bedrooms. Uh, they have case management and all different kinds of services. One of the uh, permanent supportive ho um, housing programs has been open now uh, for 12 years, and there are people who have been there 12 years, but that's why they're called permanent supportive housing. These are people <clears throat> who have been chronically homeless, but are making it in permanent supportive housing. Um, I've seen the progress so many of my homeless friends have made, and they've been able to get off the drink and the drugs, and and uh, what have you. It's, it's been interesting to see what a difference we can make in people's lives, but it's also a huge challenge for people who uh, are very um, difficult sometimes to work with. And uh, this guy, this big, huge guy, he was really tall, really big, um, and with his uh, Alaskan uh, husky and uh, I was trying to talk to him one day, he has mental illness, and uh, he told me I was a piece of S, when you can guess the rest of it. And I said, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry, Emil. Um, how can I help? So he told me to F off, and uh, he took off. Uh, but I persevered, because he's mentally ill. And a month later, I caught up with him and talking, and I said, you don't go into the shelter. And he said, no, I can't take my dog in. You know that. And I said, why? And he said, I don't have a companion certificate for him. So I said, well, if you come with me over to the Wigan Day Center, we can do that. So <clears throat> we uh, started walking, and then a couple of other homeless keep people came up and started bullying him. And he got, he really has anger, he got so angry. And normally when this kind of thing happens, I, I, I step back, the police always say, don't get involved, but I was angry at that point because we were going to do something good. And so very, uh, very rarely for me, but I raised my voice to these other two guys and I told them exactly what I thought in very polite terms and that they'd better back off and they looked at me and they were ashamed, I think, and they just said, sorry, Pamela, moved away. And Emil and I went in and he got his companion dog certificate that day. Please note the, note the harp music, isn't that? <laughs> isn't that perfect in the church? <clears throat> so, you know, Emil was great. Uh, there we go. Emil was great then, and he's allowed us to help him a little more. And it's like taking, you know, one step at a time. There are people it's so much easier to help. There are families who have been helped, and the children have recovered from the trauma of being in a homeless shelter. I don't know if you've ever seen the Midvale Family Shelter. <clears throat> when we were remodeling it a couple of years ago, we wanted to make private rooms for the families, and the city did not allow it. So on the second floor, it's this big, big room, and there's uh, just uh, bunk beds and curtains. There's not really 
uh, any privacy. It's not conducive to great healing, but it's the best we have at, at this point until something, something else gets built. And the, some of the families um, are, are able to move on. So at this one year anniversary of Operation Rio Grande, yes, there have been uh, successes. Um, yes, we are dealing with the disbursement problem, the, the drug dealing that's been going on at North Temple and the prostitutes that come along in the evening. We are lessening that with law enforcement really cracking down. Uh, the social workers are also trying to help. So yes, there's been a lot of good, but oh my goodness, there's still a great deal to be done. But I think at this point we can say that because law enforcement, the state, the county, the city, and a lot of nonprofit agencies, human services, Department of Workforce Services, all of these agencies and all of these people have come together and it's incredible teamwork. And one of my favorite acronyms is T-E-A-M. Together, everybody achieves more. And I think as we go forth uh, as a team, we'll look with pride on the people's lives that we've been able to change. But we look forward to changing even more lives with the help of all those agencies and uh, groups such as yourself. Thank you. We're going to pass the plate now, have the offering, and we're also going to hear from Carl.
Okay, we're going to now have questions and answers for about half an hour. Uh, two things, we, we want to keep that door shut right there so there's no feedback uh, from the AV system we have there. Also, when you speak, if you'll stand, and you'll speak right into the microphone so that uh, you're heard clearly in our recording system. So with that in mind, and Kathy and I will be switching back and forth, who has the first question? They're acting like my students now. Okay, question right there. Hi, Pamela, thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> my question is, when the dog sniffs out someone that you said is a criminal, what happens at that point? Um, law enforcement intervenes. Uh, there's full-time security at the road home and the other homeless uh, facilities. And um, they will be uh, questioned and asked to produce um, the drugs. Uh, I, I mean, it's not that I admire the creativity of my homeless friends, but my word, they are awfully good at hiding drugs. And uh, get it, it was the only way to find out is with a drug sniffing uh, dog. So they could be uh, arrested uh, for possession depending on the amount or what it was. Um, the one uh, huge challenge we face is the drug spice. Uh, spice is very difficult for dogs to sniff out. And uh, so people can still slip through these uh, procedures um, with spice. And spice, as many of you know, is very difficult to regulate. It doesn't matter what the legislators do in banning it, the people making spice change the ingredients. And so they're, they're bringing something that isn't, that, that doesn't make it illegal. Uh, it's one of our most uh, dangerous drugs. Uh, but the person who has the drugs on them, they can be, you know, they may be taken to jail depending on their past history, or they can be offered the necessary help. And so if they are taken to jail, is there an attempt to try to help them? Um, yes. Further? So can you just explain what that what that process is? There's a, the attempt, to, it depends on the person, whether, whether they're willing. Some of the people who have been in help with drugs, um, they just turn and walk out, leave the drugs behind and turn and walk out of the shelter and we don't see them again, they go elsewhere. Um, but we have a number of social workers um, from the state, uh, from the different agencies, and even the Salt Lake City Police has uh, eight to ten uh, social workers on their payroll now. And so they will work with this person and follow up. And some of us who work with homeless people are out in the Rio Grande area, and if somebody walks out of the shelter, we're trying to also work with them to see how we can help them. My name is Bernie Hart, and myself and my wife, wife uh, also work with a number of homeless individuals. And I have some serious concerns about the proposed uh, efforts by the Collective Impact and uh, the state of Utah for dealing with this problem, uh, because the question about what happens next, the picture is not pretty. In, the, in Operation Rio Grande, the data that was collected about people that went through drug court and through the justice system, and then were offered the choice between jail and drug treatment. The number went into drug treatment was about 100 and something, around 100. And the success that was claimed by the system and the people in the therapy programs and the court system and connected to our justice system suggested that 10% of those people that went into treatment successfully treated treatment, completed treatment. Well, what they don't suggest and what we don't take into consideration and when we consider the effectiveness in helping people is the relapse rate is 50 to 90%. So out of those 10 people, five to nine of them are gonna relapse and go back on drugs. So we actually help possibly one to five people out of those 100 people. And at that rate, we can continue to put people into treatment and, and do more drug beds, but the people that are treatment resistant <laughs> are going to continue to be in the system and in the judicial system and in the treatment system in more and more beds and praying and selling drugs to other homeless people. So I bring this up to, has one facet of what I question in the system because when, again, when you mentioned, I could go on for a while, 
I won't, but the uh, single housing as a solution. Is there a question for <laughs> My Pamela question Atkinson? is going to be a comment on these, but the other thing is the housing. I can remember back in 20 years ago in Hartford, Connecticut, or 30 years ago, where they tore down all the public housing in the area because it was a center of crime. The same thing at Palmer Court. There's all kinds of uh, police calls and trouble at Palmer Court. What is your and question, to depend please? On this as an okay, my question is, how effective is this system? Is there any data to support the idea that these methods that are gonna be put in place are actually working or have worked somewhere else? Because I'm having trouble getting that out of the system. Thank you. There's a, there's a great deal of data that's been collected. And for any of you who want to see the dashboard data, uh, the Department of Workforce Services has it online. You go to the DWS and you look for the ORG dashboard data. And that'll show you what law enforcement has been doing and uh, the numbers and also what the drug rehab programs are doing and the number of people who are, who are getting jobs. Um, no, it, it's the system we have isn't a complete success, but there has been success. And uh, one of the things we're doing a better job and have to increase what we're doing is the follow-up. You cannot have somebody come out of rehab and not have intense follow-up with case management. It's absolutely necessary. So some of us are pushing the buddy system so that every person who comes out of a rehab program has a buddy 24 hours a day. We're working within the um, Department of Corrections so, and trying to start with case managers, with people doing case management with people three months before they're going to be discharged. Obviously, this all takes money, so a lot of it has depended on the, on the legislator. But we're finding out that people who have been in, in, in the correction system, if they can get some rehab started in that system, and then when they leave, there's somebody to meet them, they have housing available, continuing treatment available, and this follow-up with case management and a buddy, and that's really helping to make a difference. Yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Pamela, for coming and talking to us. Um, I'm really impressed at the coordinated entry system, so I hope everyone is getting logged in and we understand what their problems are. What percentage are uh, mental ill in our homeless population and what percent is uh, the drug uh, dependency and would housing subsidies work to disperse these people rather than have them all in one spot where they can just get back on drugs? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, mental illness, um, at, at this point, because it's been increasing, we're, we're finding that a certain segment of the population, like 50% of, of certain chronically homeless people, are homeless chronically because of their mental illness. Um, the mental illness aspect has just been growing ever since the, um, I think it was the Reagan years when the, the mental health uh, facilities were all closed down. What, what we're saying right now is this is great to tackle the problem, bring on some extra beds, make sure there's follow-up, but why aren't we stopping the cause of the problem in, in the first place? And so there are programs now that are working with the children, like in the Granite School District, with their whole families. United Way is a perfect <clears throat> is a perfect example of this. And we're beginning to see some, some outcomes. Um, I talked to, um, at the point of the mountain, uh, they had a graduation down there of um, prisoners who had completed their high school education whilst in prison. And I was asked to give the keynote speech and ha, huh, it's one of the hardest things I prepared for because I knew a lot of them were gonna be in jail for a long time or in the prison there. But afterwards, I asked the warden permission to go around and talk to the prisoners. And I said to them, would you tell me one thing that could have been done to have prevented you being in here? And you know what the answer was? Pamela, if only somebody had cared about me. If I'd only heard the words, I love you. 
And I heard that articulated in different ways from all 30 of the prisoners. And then when I went down to the Salt Lake County Youth Detention, there were um, about two dozen kids there from um, Salt Lake County and around. Uh, I asked them the same question. They said, well, nobody seemed to care about us. If we'd had somebody who cared, and it's this caring and you know reaching out. I don't know about you, but when I see a lot of these youths hanging around and they look different and act different, um, I've learned to go and up and speak with them and, and start talking with them and just accept them as they are and find out what their dreams and hopes are too. But I think it's, it's fine, like with our justice reform system, to intervene, you know, with uh, teenagers and, and adults, but we have got to start the interventions when the children are, are small. And you'll notice, it, and it's been in the news quite a bit, we've been asking the legislature to fund more school counselors in the elementary schools. The kids are coming to school and they have so many problems and they have nobody because their single mom is working 12, 14 hours a day. They have nobody to talk to. And the schools that do have, the school psychologists and the school counselors, they're changing kids' lives. They're turning them around. And the kids are starting to feel valuable. Their self-esteem is going up. Their academic scores are going up because somebody is taking an interest in them. And I told the legislator this year uh, at one of the committee meetings, I said, with all due respect, you do a great job coming up with money for, for, for the problems, but you're not looking at early intervention and the cause of the problems. That's where you need to be putting more money. So many of them agreed, uh, fortunately. So what was their response to that? that? They funded that particular bill for more school counselors. And I talked with a lot of them one-on-one -on -one outside of the committee meeting, and they said, we have to start thinking differently now rather than intervening like with the gangs. And we have to prevent kids going into gangs and getting to that, that point. And I have to tell you, there are, there are parents who absolutely appreciate somebody coming along and saying, my word, your, your life is hard. You, you're working 12 hours a day, you've got three kids, you worry about a roof over your head and food and what have you. How can we help you? And uh, I've seen so many families turn their lives around because they've, they've found somebody who cared about them and who said, uh, we love you and we're here to help you, really. You tell us what you need. Uh. Yeah, hi, Pamela, I'm Annie. Um, first, I wanna say thank you for everything because um, I was homeless a year ago and I've been in the recovery community now for um, almost a year since last October. I went into Odyssey House because of um, Operation Rio Grande. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask about TA Medicaid and what it has to do with Operation Rio Grande and what kind of things it offers. The Medicaid program? Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> there's several um, aspects of, of Medicaid um, going on. We did get a bill through um, that actually uh, helps the homeless uh, population. It's geared into the homeless population, particularly those who are in uh, prison and getting them the, the Medicaid needs. Um, our goal is that when they come out of prison for Medicaid, when they're eligible, we already have a plan uh, uh, for them. Um, and then last session, we had a bill for Medicaid um, uh, expansion. And um, I was a governor's point person and um, also an advocate working with the Senate to get this bill passed that would help so many low-income people. If, if people aren't healthy, how are they supposed to be productive? And one of the lines I used with the senators uh, was the following. <clears throat> um, I don't, Senator, I don't see you being against this bill that would give low-income people the opportunity to get healthy and experience the dignity of work. Um, well, at first they, they laughed and then they thought about it. But 
um, I have to tell you, we needed 15 votes in the Senate to get it through, and we actually got 20 votes. And there were several people who surprisingly voted for it. And now we're working with the federal government and um, our governor knows uh, Vice President Mike Spence rather well because we need this waiver to, to go ahead with it. So we're working with the White House as well as with the Department of, of Health and uh, Human Services. But to me, you can't expect people to get out of homelessness or prevent homelessness if they're not healthy mentally and physically. And there is, will be money in the Medicaid expansion program to help with both of these areas. So hopefully we'll, we'll get the, the waiver. Anything you can do calling your uh, congressman, is, it's very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> I, I absolutely believe that we've got to do more prevention. Um, medical and mental health is a big deal, but one of the things I have noticed with homeless people, their teeth are horrid. They have chronic dental pain. Uh, children who have never had access to a dentist because they were homeless. Um, I, I know the, the dental director of the homeless clinic, I mean, he is giving hope to the homeless when he can actually fix their teeth. He had one patient come in and said, I, I, if you could just fix my teeth, I might get a job at McDonald's. Cause, and then he smiled and of course he said, no one will hire me with teeth like this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, simple interventions with, uh, and Medicaid expansion is not gonna help with dental care, and dental care might help prevent some of the opiate addiction and the drug problems. And I'm, uh, we all hear about universal health care. I'm a guess that Medicaid, it doesn't cover dental. Um, and I, I wish we could expand uh, dental coverage for more people because uh, the teeth uh, it results in more medical illnesses, which also cause, you know, it's all, it's all mixed in. So. Um, I know we can't fix everyone's teeth, but uh, is there anything to help with getting dental care included with a medical and mental uh, care? That's okay. Thank you, it's a good question. Dental health is one of our top priorities. Um, the number of people who have to cover their mouths because they're so ashamed of, of their teeth. And people um, who are very intelligent, who want to get a job, find that they don't, and it's because of their teeth. You know, the Salt Lake Donated Dental uh, Group was started uh, probably 15, 18 years ago, and they do an incredible job. <clears throat> we also have the community health centers that are federally funded, and these centers provide dental coverage. We have various dental clinics, and there's a mobile van that, that, that also goes around. Um, there's a senior uh, uh, foundation that also has a van that goes around and, and fixes uh, teeth for people um, who, who are over 65. But, but the other thing is, we're saying that dental has to be an, an incredible part of overall health. Um, I don't know about you, but I go to the dentist regularly. Do I like it? Uh-uh, I hate the dentist, always hate it. I hate the dentist since when I was seven years old and this dentist I, by the school nurse sent me and the dentist pulled this tooth out without any anesthetic. And uh, I yelled and he hit me several times. I, I mean, I didn't go back for another 12 years and you can guess. So I, I take, I go to the dentist. In fact, I go every three months and because of the, uh, I want to prevent uh, the problems occurring. But our homeless friends don't have this luxury. But know that the 4th Street Clinic, they not only have medical health, they have behavioral health, but they also have dental health now. And some of that's private funding, but much of it comes from uh, the federal government and the incredible change in people's self-esteem going up once they've had their, their, their teeth fixed. So more and more people are placing importance on it. Um, I go to a dentist, one of the reasons I go to him, I, I really quite like him and he's, he's very good, <clears throat> but I go to him because he volunteers every Friday on fixing teeth 
for people who are uninsured. Ask your dentists if they volunteer their time at one of these clinics to keep the cost down. They use volunteer, great dentists. Uh, hi, I'm Marita Hart, and thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned Emil. Um, he's in our program now, and I'd like to know how you can help us help him, because he has, you mentioned that you had taken him in to get more services, but he has emphysema. So where do we go with that? Because he says he goes to the emergency room and he comes out, <clears throat> excuse me, with a new inhaler, and that doesn't really help. So maybe you, you could help us help him. Every homeless person needs a medical home, and the emergency room is not a medical home. The emergency room is for emergencies, for trauma. And much as I respect the doctors in the emergency room, they're not primary care physicians. They know how to treat trauma, but they don't know how to treat <clears throat> some of the needs of people who are using the emergency room. If they go to the 4th Street Clinic, if they're homeless, they can go to Salt Lake Donated Dental if they're not homeless. But they can go to the community health centers that have uh, dental <clears throat> and medical care. But there are a number of services down there. If that's what you're asking, are you asking where they can go for this treatment rather than the emergency room? I'm sorry, there's a bit of an echo around back here, so. Yeah, more, I guess more about encouraging him and um, if his only answer is um, that I get a, na a new inhaler and that's the end of it and he has emphysema, <clears throat> where does he go from there? Where How is do he, we encourage yeah. him to go somewhere Where is else? he living right now? Yeah, on the street with his dog. Do you know where he's sleeping at night? On the street. Yeah, which street, the at whereabouts? Well, he comes to our program three times a week. So. Okay, um, Volunteers of America has an outreach program, and I'm very familiar with that because I, I helped start it 20 years ago. <clears throat> and they have a van that goes around and stops and, and helps homeless people, and <clears throat> if we knew where to find him, we can give Volunteers of America, or you can call them yourself. And that is, they're the ones who have all of the services available. They have the case management. They have the um, uh, in-house counseling. They have the youth program. But these are the experts. <clears throat> and I, I have to tell you, um, I don't feel like an expert at, at times. I have a vast network of resources. And when I meet somebody and I think, uh-uh, Pamela, I get other people involved who are the experts. And in this case, I would say the outreach team, the social workers there are the experts and could meet uh, with this uh, man. Having said that, there are also people who will resist that kind of help. And we just love them and keep working with them. But having that outreach team with the experts, I think would make a, a huge amount of difference. So it's called Volunteers of America, and it's their outreach team. Thank you. I'd like you to address, if you might, uh, access to affordable housing. Uh, I understood from your comments that uh, prices have gone up on housing. Uh, income for the lower income has stayed flat or gone down. <clears throat> Government supports have stayed frozen or decreased. Uh, if you could have it your way, what would you do to make sure everyone had affordable housing? And then, given the po political realities, what do you think might be worth working for? Uh, yeah, very good question. As the, as the economy has improved, wages have not. 
and, and this is part of the problem. You're aware that our minimum wage in Utah is still 750 an hour? And I've been working on that for, for, for years. I even did a white paper on it. Um, you're aware, probably some of you, that the living wage is close to $17 an hour. And a living wage comprises um, uh, housing, utility, you know, rent, utilities, transportation, childcare. That's $17 an hour. Last night at a family dinner, um, I was talking to my grandson, and he'd uh, been in California with, at his girlfriend's house, and they live in Menlo Park. And it surprised me what Alex said. He said that three fast food restaurants in that area were offering $17 an hour for the fast food work. And that is because fewer people are applying for those jobs, and so they've had to up the amount um, that they're offering. What we're finding here in Utah <clears throat> is that many places are offering 10 to $12 an hour now, which is certainly better than the, the, the 750. Uh, but that's not enough for a, a married person uh, with uh, uh, you know, two kids. You can't live on $10 an hour, which means two job, two job family. It means that the dad has to work maybe 12 to 14 hours a day. We have at the state level and the county and the city level, the groups working on the affordable housing. And there are some plans that are going to be implemented and are being implemented. But we are way behind and should have started 10, 15 years ago on these affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> the uh, SROs will help a group of people. But obviously, single room occupancies aren't for everybody. It's for people, one person who wants to live alone. Um, we have to help educate and inform. And that's our job as citizens, is to inform and educate the decision makers. And that's what many of us spend our time doing with state government, county government, and city government. And we have to get the developers on as part of our team who are willing to go for the tax credits that are available and build the housing at, at less cost. Um, I saw some condos being built and I was told that they were affordable. And so I was really excited and I, I looked and talked to the, the, the construction people and no, they're not going to be affordable for, for low income people. Uh, you're gonna have to make an awful lot of money to afford one of those condos uh, on the west side. So join in with the groups that are already working on it. We need as much advocacy as possible, <clears throat> and particularly at the federal level. If somebody could take on Ben Carson, as a lot of us have done, Ben Carson says people should pay 38% of their income rather than 30%. Ben Carson wants to get rid of Section 8 and all of the public housing. He just says if people would just work harder. So we have some choice words for Mr. Carson, and I'm glad he's decided not to come to Utah, but he has other people come. And, and we have a good relationship with some of the people at HUD, but they can only do so far. But sometimes Congress comes through and they knock down Ben Carson's uh, proposals. <clears throat> and the bill that's um, passed the House is in the Senate right now, and there are different bills that, that hold the money for housing, but they'll have the conference committee. Um, it has food stamps and all kinds of things in it. So we're hoping that um, common sense will prevail, and up to this point it has, as long as Mr. Carson stays out of it, it's helpful. So please continue advocating, because this is a very important area. Thank you for coming in and presenting on this really important topic. <clears throat> Hearing that you're working with the current administration, um, it, it speaks volumes to your irrepressible commitment to helping the homeless. <clears throat> I had a question. Um, I was wondering if you would be willing to speak to um, the resources that are provided for 
adult mental health services um, in Utah, um, whether that's federal funding, uh, state level programs, or nonprofit partners, specifically um, education, screening, treatment, and ongoing support. And then as a follow-up question, I wanted to also ask, um, what do you perceive as the biggest gaps currently in Utah for adult mental health services? The biggest uh, what? The, the largest um, gap as far as needs go that aren't being currently addressed either by federal, state, or nonprofit programs? You, there's a multiplicity of problems regarding mental health and that's easy to say. It's, it's just that there's a stigma attached to mental health still that shouldn't be, that people aren't willing to talk about it. When you, you know, one of the things I'm, I, I'm involved in, um, <clears throat> other than working directly with homeless people and the state government county, is I, I work on prevention of suicide. I'm also working uh, in the area of human trafficking, and I'm also working in the area of prevention of um, child abuse. And th th there's a connection between so many youth having, being depressed, but not being able to talk about it, and suicide. And there's, a, there's a connection between pornography and suicide. There's a connection between um, uh, suicide and, and child abuse. There's a connection between mental health and, and suicide. In, in doing some of the, this uh, research, the connections are becoming much clearer. It, it's just that the decision makers, some of them still feel there's a great stigma. You don't talk about mental health issues until it happens to one of your own family. Um, money is, is a problem. I think uh, Utah, in the last few years in the legislature, have taken some, some giant leaps uh, forward. I think, you know, the expansion of uh, beds in, in Odyssey House and in the House of Hope and, and elsewhere, it, it's making a difference, but again, um, you know, I hate to say this, but really, uh, every one of you who drives had to um, take an exam and pass an exam and get a license to drive. I'm sometimes thinking that somebody who wants to have a baby, that they, they need to get a license. That, uh, classes leading up to that license <laughs> in terms of what it all means, mainly because I think Parenting involves knowledge of mental well-being and what is it that we all should do to help a child in terms of their mental health. You know, the minute a child gets a cold or something, the mom becomes worried. But what happens when the child shows those first signs of mental well-being not exactly being 100%? Does the parent recognize it? Probably not if they're worried about getting food on the table. I, I think that we've got to create greater awareness amongst the general public who are the advocates and who should be uh, advocating with the decision makers, whether it be here in the state, the county, the city, or back um, in, in Washington, uh, D.C. Um, I mean, do you ever call your congressman and talk about these issues? Rhetorical question. How, you know, how many of you do that? A lot of you do it, and we need to keep on doing it, because eventually they're going to understand that prevention is better than dealing with uh, mental illness later, which involves suicide and, and drugs and guns and just all kinds of things. But don't expect to suddenly, you know, for a 22-year-old who's had mental illness all his life, don't expect to say, oh, well, he's mentally ill. So where were the people back when he was born and in school and what have you? I, I think we all need to be more alert. And I, I don't know if I'm answering your question uh, in the right way, but 
to me, we just don't create that awareness, raising consciousness that we're all responsible. Um, the little boy next door some years ago, he was three years old when his dad died, and he got depressed. And he and his mother just often got into it. Not the little boy, but the mother did. And she was stressed out and lots of loud voices. And what this little boy started to do was run over to my house if I was home and ring the doorbell. And I said, oh, hi, lovely to see you. We did not talk about what was happening in his house. We talked about everything but, until finally he'd say, thanks, Pamela, bye. Uh, and he was fine. And he continued to do that year after year. I became a significant other in his life. And when he got married, I got the most beautiful letter from him. But I've often wondered, what if we all became significant others in other children's lives so they had somewhere to go to feel good about themselves, that this was another problem? And, you know, eventually the mother got the help she needed. But the little boy, meanwhile, he did very well because he had someone next door who, who loved him and who listened to him. And I just think we have to do more of that. Um, I was talking uh, to the governor the other day and I asked him for some help in a campaign. But I want to start a campaign. Um, I think this country is getting so divisive and I think it's a causing the problems we're having, it causing the divisiveness is causing depression, mental illness and what have you. And I just wondered, um, for, every, for every negative tweet, for every negative headline that we see, what if each of us said, okay, who can I help? We can say a word of gratitude to someone. We can say to someone, oh my word, you look wonderful today, or we can take a meal to a stressed out homeless single, excuse me, to a single working mother. We can volunteer for an hour a week. We can read to some kids at school and help them with their reading. There are almost unlimited number of kind deeds that we can do. And what if everyone here today did this on a daily basis, every time a negative tweet comes out. I'm sure there are some negative tweets on my phone right now. I probably won't even look at them today. But I think it's up to us to also take a stand. And I'm at the stage where I've, I've decided I will not allow what's going on back there to make my life divisive. I will continue to reach out and care and love. I will continue to do things for other people as they do for me. But I do think we all have to take some responsibility and it's a one by one. So the governor and I are gonna have further talks, but it's about civility and it's about kindness. And I'm sure all of you do kind deeds every day, but if we make a concerted effort, I think we can uh, change. And I think what Utah does, I think we could uh, spread it to the rest of the nation. And I see Tim slowly walking towards me and I think my time is up. And so let's express appreciation. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. As I said at the outset, today is the last in our Summer Forum Speaker Series. Starting next Sunday, Reverend Tom Goldsmith will be back at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on the 19th as well as the 26th, uh, those services being before the Labor Day weekend. So one service starting at 10 o'clock. And uh, we're going to slip next door to Elliott Hall for coffee and more conversation, the opportunity to ask questions. A number of you had questions, and simply there's never enough time for all these questions to talk about this important subject. Let's express appreciation to our, again to our guests. <laughs> Excellent.
And I see a quick hand from Di. Oh, yes. Appreciation to Carl. Thank you. My parents wish I could play like you do. So, so. Okay, everybody.